is my mom. She's been there for me the whole way. We traveled together. I was born and raised um, here. I'm half Dominican and half Ecuadorian, so I get to see a little bit of both cultures. And that sort of also inspired me to want to open up to many different cultures. Visiting all these places, it's pretty similar to being in the Bronx because in the Bronx you just have everybody from different cultures all around you. So being in the Bronx is just sort of like being around so many countries and it's just really one neighborhood. Voices from outside Comprehensive Model School Project 327 in the Mount Eaton section of the Bronx. Support for NPR comes from member stations and from the George Gund Foundation, working to make Cleveland more vibrant, sustainable, and just, and setting an example for the nation. More information available at gundfoundation.org. And the Doris Duke Foundation, which aims to support the well-being of people and the planet for a more creative, equitable, and sustainable future. Marketplace Morning Report is coming up next, and then in 10 minutes at 9 o'clock, it's the BBC News Hour on WNYC. Let's check in with London and see what they're working on. Hello, London. Good morning, WNYC. I'm James Menendez. Today on News Hour, severe dehydration and malnutrition stalk the tent cities of Gaza. The UN says more than a million people are at risk. We'll hear why supplies are still not getting in. Also, how wild chimps who are sick or injured seek out plants with healing properties and how that might help us. That's BBC News Hour at 9 on WNYC. 79 and sunny right now. Chance of afternoon showers and storms today. Mostly sunny and 92, but of course feeling hotter than that. Same thing tomorrow, even hotter on Sunday. Across the river, across the Hudson, higher temps and hotter feel in north and central Jersey. Heat advisories posted. Be careful out there. Air quality alerts posted as well. WNYC supporters include... The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, helping public radio advance journalistic excellence in the digital age. The Knight Foundation believes informed and engaged communities are essential for healthy democracy. More at kf.org. Lake Street Dive is well known in music circles for being a powerhouse live act, even though their manager jokes they're the biggest band no one has ever heard of. But now that they're headlining Madison Square Garden later this year, she might have to retire that quick. On the day that they release their latest album, they'll join us for a performance in WNYC's Studio 5. Lake Street Dive, live on the next All of It. Join us weekdays at noon on WNYC. The clock is ticking for TikTok. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Progressive Insurance with Snapshot. Learn more about Snapshot at Progressive.com or 1-800-PROGRESSIVE. Snapshot not available in California or from all agents. From Marketplace, I'm Nancy Marshall Genzer in for David Brancaccio. TikTok's Chinese parent company, ByteDance, has six months to divest or the U.S. plans to ban the app for national security reasons. Now ByteDance is going on the offensive and a new court filing. It calls the demands of the U.S. government unconstitutional and it says government officials have refused to seriously negotiate for two years. Marketplace's Nova Safo has more. The U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. has scheduled oral arguments three months from now to consider lawsuits filed by TikTok, ByteDance, and TikTok users challenging a law passed by Congress earlier this year, which gives ByteDance until January 19 to divest TikTok to avoid a ban. In new court filings, TikTok and ByteDance say the law violates Americans' free speech rights because a rapid divestiture is technically not possible, meaning that the law is essentially a ban of an app that the government simply doesn't like. American intelligence agencies say there are close ties between TikTok's parent ByteDance and the Chinese government. They worry that China can use the app to spy on Americans or manipulate public opinion in the U.S. But in its brief, TikTok and ByteDance say Congress ignored less restrictive alternatives, including an agreement which would have set up new safeguards for TikTok users. That agreement was never signed, the company says, because government officials stopped negotiating nearly two years ago. I'm Nova Safo for Marketplace. Banking, more than any other sector, is ripe for disruption by artificial intelligence. That's according to a report out this week from Citibank. It finds that more than half of banking jobs could potentially be automated. Marketplace's Stephanie Hughes has that one. 
Time-consuming financial tasks likely to be delegated to AI in the future, copying numbers from one computer system to another, and synthesizing a bunch of financial information quickly. So if you're an analyst and you're reading an awful lot of documents, you can have the technology give you a quick and dirty summary of it. Sophia Bantanitas is an analyst with Citi. She's one of the authors of that new report, which says AI could transform finance. Bantanitas says some jobs will disappear, but there will be new ones too, like making sure the artificial intelligence is getting correct data to spit out the right results. But making sure also the organization is doing the right thing and that it is asking the machines the right questions. Another thing that computer bankers won't be as good at as human bankers, dealing with human customers. Gil Luria is a senior analyst at DA Davidson. The softer skills are going to become that much more important. Talking to somebody, understanding what their needs are. People still get the meaning of a wink and a nod better than a computer does. Also, people know how to wink and nod. I'm Stephanie Hughes for Marketplace. Let's do the numbers. The FTSE in London is down more than a half percent. The Dow, S&P and Nasdaq futures are also down in the one to three tenths percent range, with the Dow future down more than 50 points. The 10-year Treasury yield is up at 4.23 percent. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Amazon Business. From small business to big enterprise and everything in between, Amazon Business helps simplify the supplies buying process. Amazon Business, your partner for smart business buying. And by How We Survive, a podcast from Marketplace. Climate change is dire, but there are ways we can make a difference. Listen to the new season of How We Survive wherever you get your podcasts. Digitally altered images, audio clips or videos often meant to spread false information are known as deep fakes. These kinds of misleading fabrications often generated with the help of artificial intelligence are especially worrying during an election year. There's concern about how deep fakes are being used to influence voters. But it's not just politicians, celebrities and influencers who should be worried about their likenesses being stolen. Marketplace's China correspondent Jennifer Pack reports from Shanghai. In the last eight months, deep fakes of foreigners have been popping up on Chinese social media. In one video, a woman by the name of Lillian with brown hair and glasses speaks near perfect Mandarin. Do you know why men nowadays don't want to spend money on women anymore, she asks. Her videos appear in at least two dozen accounts with different names like Elena, Aurora and Rosalie. Her real name is Andrea Gabor. She's in New York. Tell me your first reaction when I reached out to you. I was stunned. <laughs> you know, first of all, I'm a relative nobody. Well, she is a business journalism professor and says she's very careful about what she posts online. Still, they basically stole an image of mine from, you know, a relatively wonky, obscure economic institute where I had done an interview. But instead of talking about economics, her deepfakes give love advice. And that's typical, says Chen Yan in Beijing. He keeps tabs on the latest AI technologies. A foreigner in China giving what we call chicken soup for the soul type advice is a big contrast. It attracts people's attention. Once there's enough attention or followers, he says then the accounts can sell products or online courses. Sure enough, Andrea Gabor's deepfakes no longer talk about love. Now they peddle Russian honey, biscuits and sea salt. It's getting cheaper and easier to create deepfakes. AI expert Chen Yan generated one of his own. It took me 20 seconds to choose a topic. A digital person I've trained before, a voice model I've trained, then I click download. A couple minutes later, a video of him selling medical insurance appears. Okay, his mouth is not in sync with the audio, but there's a lot these deepfakes get right. Let's go back to Professor Andrea Gabor's deepfakes. Obviously, it's weird to have Mandarin or whatever was coming out of my mouth, but it sounded like my voice. And she only knew because I saw a Shanghai media, the paper, identify her in the deepfakes. To me, that's the tip of the iceberg. To me, the dangers are much more profound to our democracy. 
like she says how deepfakes could be used to manipulate voters in the next U.S. election. In Shanghai, I'm Jennifer Pack for Marketplace. Our executive producer is Kelly Severa. Our digital producer is Dylan Mietinen. Our engineers are John Brewington and Brian Allison. In Washington, I'm Nancy Marshall Genzer with the Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media. Support for WNYC comes from The Met, now on view, a new exhibition tells the story of the creative visionary who shaped Tiffany & Co. Museum admission is pay what you wish for New Yorkers. Learn more at metmuseum.org. Up next, the BBC News Hour on WNYC. Today on the Brian Lair Show, legal analysis from a constitutional law scholar on the latest Supreme Court opinions and a preview of the big ones still expected this month. Plus, a history of the fight for New York City's landmark gay rights bill. Those conversations and more at 10 this morning on WNYC. 80 and sunny right now. Today, mostly sunny and hot. 92 feeling hotter with a chance of afternoon showers and thunderstorms. Just about the same tomorrow. Hotter on Sunday. This is WNYC. FM, HD, and AM. New York. News are live from the BBC World Service in London. I'm James Menendez. Today, as temperatures soar, doctors in Gaza say they're seeing more and more cases of severe dehydration as well as malnutrition. The UN says more than a million people are at risk. You can't imagine the temperature in our tent. And the water you drink is definitely contaminated because both old and young are getting sick. We'll find out why adequate supplies of food and water are still not getting in. Also, the French elections and how opinion in President Macron's hometown is swinging towards the far right. All I know is that today the national rally is a party just like any other. It's a party that says it is for the French and which tries to do the maximum for the French. Plus, self-medicating chimps and how fake versions of the weight loss drug Azempic are getting into clinics. All that and more after the news. Hello, I'm Govinda Gill with the BBC News. A police watchdog is investigating reports that a protester was shot by police during demonstrations against proposed tax increases in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. The Independent Policing Oversight Authority said it had documented the death as a result of police shooting. Protesters say the controversial finance bill would choke the economy. And Soy is in Nairobi. Since the current administration took over, we have seen a rapid increase of taxes. New taxes have been introduced and those that existed have been increased. Income tax, for instance, uh, for the highest earners was increased from 30 to 35 percent. That is in the current financial year that's about to come to an end. They introduced something called a housing levy that is 1 percent of income tax. And in the next financial year, which begins on the 1st of July, we expect yet another tax universal health coverage about 2.7 percent. The Ukrainian bridge that has been deployed to help defend the eastern town of Chasiv Yar from a Russian assault says fighting there has become extremely difficult. Russian forces have been trying to seize the hilltop town aiming to occupy all of the Donetsk region. The authorities in Jordan say they have detained several travel agents and individuals who facilitated the unofficial travel of Muslim pilgrims to Saudi Arabia. Unregistered pilgrims do not have access to proper facilities at ritual sites. Yusuf Taha reports. The Jordanian government spokesman Mohanad al Mubaydeen said that an investigation into Jordanian pilgrims who were not part of the country's official Hajj mission found some unscrupulous travel agents. Mr. Mubaydeen said they did not obtain the correct visas or make proper reservations for their clients, causing the death of some of them. Egypt is conducting a similar investigation. Several countries have confirmed the death of their citizens during this year's Hajj as temperatures rose above 50 degrees Celsius. The U.S. military says a temporary pier off the coast of the Gaza Strip has been re-anchored, allowing the resumption of aid deliveries. Strong winds and heavy seas have meant the $300 million structure has only been operational for 10 days. 600 tonnes were delivered on Thursday. Sam Rose is UNRWA's Director of Planning. 
It's a very small drop in a very big bucket. The situation here now is getting so complicated in terms of people's needs, which go far beyond trucks of food or boats worth of food. It's sanitation, it's health care, it's people's well-being and mental health, all of which contribute to a situation in which people are increasingly unable to care for themselves, to look after themselves. And what we're also seeing after eight months of barbaric, savage conflict is a real breakdown in law and order. You're listening to World News from the BBC. On WNYC 79 and Sunny at 9.04, I'm Michael Hill. New York State Attorney General Letitia James says insurance company United Healthcare is going to have to pay up for failing to provide birth control coverage. WNYC's Catalina Gonela has details. It started when a patient in Brooklyn submitted a complaint to the Attorney General's office after United Healthcare denied them coverage for their oral contraceptive. A.G. James says that violated New York's Comprehensive Contraceptive Coverage Act, which requires health insurance plans to cover FDA-approved contraceptives without copays, restrictions, or delays. James also announced that on top of the $1 million penalty, the health insurance company will reimburse consumers who paid out of pocket for birth control. United Healthcare did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Manhattan families will soon have priority for the competitive seats at a high school of the boroughs most sought after high schools at a handful of the boroughs most sought after high schools. City Schools Chancellor David Banks says it should help kids with their commute times. So many Manhattan kids went to schools that were a long train ride away. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. And so we want all of our parents to be able to send their kids to good high schools that are close to home. The list includes some popular choices for families such as Eleanor Roosevelt and Millennium High Schools. Banks says the new policy will not significantly change the number of low-income students at the schools. Some families from School District 2, which runs from the Upper East Side to Tribeca, have been upset since the city eliminated priority they had on nearby schools. Banks said he wanted to respond to their concerns while offering Manhattan families a leg up. Delays on seven trains both ways. NJ Transit rail service suspended in and out of Penn Station once again. Cross honoring is underway. 79 and sunny, another hot one, mostly sunny 92, but feeling hotter than that. Hello and welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service. We're coming to you live from London. I'm James Menendez. And coming up later on today's programme, we'll be looking at how fake weight loss and diabetes drugs can find their way into pharmacies. Also, why the US is banning a popular antivirus uh, software and how chimpanzees uh, self-medicate. All that's coming up uh, during the course of the hour. But we are going to start today in Gaza, where conditions for people living there are said to be deteriorating fast. That's despite what seems like weeks or months of appeals to Israel to allow more supplies in. That's food, water and medicines for what remains of the territory's hospitals. The United Nations is warning that more than a million people in Gaza may reach the highest level of starvation by the middle of July. Amid sweltering temperatures and a lack of clean water, doctors in Gaza say they're seeing more and more cases of severe dehydration, malnutrition and the spread of disease, especially among young children. Our correspondent in Jerusalem, John Donison, has been reporting on this. And before hearing his report, I asked him first how hard it was to get a first-hand picture of what's going on in Gaza. Well, it's difficult when you don't have uh, eyes and ears on the ground. Both Israel and Egypt are not currently allowing foreign journalists into Gaza, despite uh, repeated requests for them to do so. So we rely on a team of uh, freelancers in Gaza who are operating under very uh, difficult conditions who then send us uh, the material out uh, and we put it together here. So it's not ideal uh, and because you're not there to ask uh, the questions, uh, but it is what it is. So we've been looking at the issue of dehydration and malnutrition in Gaza, especially amongst uh, young children, uh, a problem that's being exacerbated at the moment by soaring temperatures uh, close to 40 degrees. It's been in the high 30s uh, most of this week, which is making life extremely difficult. 
Along the corridor at NASA Hospital lies five-year-old Tala. She is just about awake, but not moving. Her milky eyes rolled to the back of her head. Tala is chronically dehydrated and malnourished. Her father Ibrahim holds her hand and tries to offer comfort, but he knows scorching weather close to 40 degrees and a lack of clean water have brought his daughter close to death. The situation is getting worse. You can't imagine the temperature in our tent. And the water you drink is definitely contaminated because both old and young are getting sick. And with their houses destroyed, hundreds of thousands of Gazans are now displaced and living under canvas with little protection from the scorching sun. Getting water, whether it's clean or not, is a daily struggle. Long queues form at distribution centers. With the sewage system badly damaged and with few toilets, what water there is is easily contaminated. Dr. Ahmed Al Fari is head of the children's department at NASA Hospital. It is no secret that the biggest cause of intestinal infections currently occurring in the Gaza Strip is the contamination of the water supply to these children. But with fighting ongoing, the United Nations says two-thirds of the Strip's water and sanitation systems, poor at the best of times, have already been destroyed. Salam Sharab is a water engineer for the Khan Yunis municipality. We need a tremendous international effort to re-establish water and sewage networks. We in Khan Yunis have lost between 170 and 200 kilometers of pipes, which have been completely destroyed, along with the wells and the water tanks. And the most vulnerable are affected too. Yunis Jumar is nine years old. He has cerebral palsy and epilepsy, but malnutrition and dehydration mean he's now in hospital. Stretched out on a hospital bed, semi-unconscious, his twisted small frame is hard to look at. His arms and legs like matchsticks, his knee joints bulging, his chest heaving with the skin stretched tight over his ribcage. Eight months of war in Gaza has taken its toll. Eunice is now severely dehydrated and malnourished. His mother, Hanima, standing beside him, says her son is severely dehydrated and malnourished. When he developed his malnutrition and dehydration, he became, as you see, for almost a full week, he was too ill and stopped eating and drinking correctly. The UN has warned more than a million Gazans are facing the highest level of starvation by the middle of July. The International Criminal Court prosecutor has accused Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war. Israel strongly disputes this, and its ministers have denied there is a humanitarian crisis. John Donison reporting from Jerusalem. So, why is not enough food and water getting through to people in Gaza? Israel says 200 trucks are going in every day. And today, the US says its floating pier for aid shipments is once again operational, despite numerous setbacks. For an assessment, I've been talking to J. Stephen Morrison, who's director of the Global Health Policy Centre at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. That's a bipartisan think tank based in Washington, D.C., how would he characterize the situation in Gaza right now? There's unspeakable suffering and an extraordinary humanitarian crisis unfolding. Eight months of siege, eight months of blockade. The new phase of the war began six weeks ago on May 6th, the Rafah offensive. Almost every citizen has been displaced, often multiple times. There's collapse of the health system, the sewage system, waste management water treatment and uh, what we're seeing is um, excess mortality and the spread of acute respiratory disease, diarrhea and severe malnutrition. The prospect of starvation uh, looms and now it's made obviously much worse by the fact that you have uh, intense heat, a lack of clean water and uh, no protection from the sun in these displaced camps and a health system that is really barely functioning right now. And the collapse of order inside Gaza, where you have no municipal workers, you now have no police force functioning, means that armed gangs, organized crime has taken over. And there's been a societal fraying. 
And so what relief does get through the single single gate that is functioning, which is in the south at Karen Shalom, is accumulating there. There's some estimated 1,500 trucks where the trucks just simply cannot move into this chaos because the risk of looting and shooting and beating of the of the drivers is too high. So we've reached a moment of extraordinary paralysis. So uh, lots of factors that you outline. I mean, climatic. Uh, we've got the, the fighting as well, particularly uh, around Rafa, the breakdown of law and order. Um, who, though, should bear primary responsibility for the situation that you describe? It's clearly the Israeli military and the Israeli uh, leadership that has failed to put forward any vision of governance to uh, put in place as as Hamas has been routed from these different areas. And so instead of any kind of alternative governing situation being put in force, we have this chaos and, and, and descent into organized crime. Can I just ask you this? I mean, Israel says that about 200 trucks a day are going through that crossing at Karem Shalom. We've also had the announcement today that the U.S. built here uh, off the coast of Gaza is now operational uh, again and uh, more aid being unloaded there. I mean, on, on, on the pier, overall, has that been anything more than just a PR exercise, do you think? Well, it's more than a PR exercise in the sense that I think the Department of Defense, under orders from the President of the United States, went about this with every intention to open a pier and be able to deliver an estimated 150 trucks per day, providing 2 million meals per day. But what has happened is that aid flows have been negligible, just over 4,000 metric tons since first opening uh, May 17th. It's been averaging seven trucks a day versus 150. It's br the seas have proven to be uh, rougher and more difficult to navigate. The pier has broken twice and had to be moved over for repairs. And the seas are getting rougher and rougher as we head towards the fall. I, I, I think that it's most likely that this pier will only be operational for a few more weeks at the most. And its impact is going to be negligible. This type of pier has been used effectively in Somalia, in Haiti, in Kuwait. It's proven to be uh, not nearly as effective in this context. But there have also been unanswered questions if it had been able to deliver the volumes that it had hoped to deliver, there was still un unanswered questions as to what happens when that aid hit the beach, i.e., who were going to be the operational partners. World Food Program was encouraged. It did tenuously. It was afraid of the security risks. There was going to be no military escorts. That would have put the IDF uh, into a position where the humanitarians were very uncomfortable. The IDF tried to escort commercial flows coming in from the West Bank back in March, and it, it was a catastrophe. Uh, 700 people shot and 170 killed uh, in a riot and, and a panicked response from the IDF. So there were no answers on how the, how, how the food was going to be delivered. Uh, safely and securely and not looted and how it was going to reach those those who who needed to be most desperately uh, reached. Uh, and that seems to be the, the essential story of, of the problem of getting aid to people within Gaza. There is all this aid sort of piling up on on the on the borders of Gaza, but getting to the getting it to the people who need it seems to have proved impossible. And I just wonder finally, I mean, Hamas must bear some responsibility for that. Absolutely. Hamas has demonstrated no concern with the harrowing loss of life and the unspeakable suffering that Gazans have, have experienced in this period. Uh, they have shown themselves willing to make use of civilian infrastructure to mount their operations. They have used human shields in many of these settings. And of course, uh, they are executing this war beneath the ground in the system of tunnels that, by definition, are, are below large population centers. That does not excuse the Israelis using 2,000-pound bombs on civilian residential neighborhoods. But Hamas has, has used this suffering and excess death to its advantage strategically uh, in trying to isolate Israel.
and trying to push towards a ceasefire arrangement. And it's been a fairly cynical and brutal calculation. And Hamas must be held to account. Both sides in this war are engaging in crimes of war. J. Stephen Morrison of the CSIS. Well, we did ask COGAT, that's the Israeli agency responsible for facilitating aid into Gaza, for an interview, but they didn't respond. Uh, we also asked the Pentagon, US Central Command, if they'd like to respond to criticisms of that military peer. Uh, they told us they were considering the request. You're listening to News. At 9.19, this is WNYC. Coming up next on The Brian Lair Show, legal analysis from a constitutional law scholar on the latest Supreme Court opinions and a preview of the big ones still expected this month. Plus, a history of the fight for New York City's landmark gay rights bill. Those conversations at 10 on WNYC. 80 and sunny right now today, mostly sunny and hot. 92 will feel hotter than that with chances of afternoon showers and storms. Just about the same tomorrow and Sunday, 94. I'm Peter Sagal. The Surgeon General has recommended putting a warning label on social media, a picture of yourself hunched over in the toilet scrolling Snapchat. Join us at your own risk for this week's news quiz from NPR. Tomorrow morning at 11 on WNYC. WNYC supporters include Brooklyn Waldorf School, teaching the whole child head, hands, and heart from preschool through eighth grade, serving the future through critical thinking, emotional intelligence, and practical arts. More at brooklynwaldorf.org. Fernandez with News Out Live from the BBC. Now to some big news from the world of tech. Your digital life matters. Protect it with the new Kaspersky. Like this guy. He gets it. That's an ad for the Russian cybersecurity firm Kaspersky Lab, now banned from selling its popular antivirus software in the United States. The U.S. Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, said the Russian government was able to use firms like Kaspersky to steal information or to plant malware on American computers, something the company denies. There are about 400 million users of Kaspersky software around the world and about a quarter of a million corporate clients. Well, let's talk to the cybersecurity expert, Jen Ellis. Jen, good to have you on the programme. Um, with those numbers, this is big, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, I think it is. Um, I think it's fairly unprecedented, if I'm honest, um, to, to, you know, we've we've previously had a situation where they banned it from use in the government. And we've seen that happen with other technology, right? We've seen it with with Huawei and we've seen it with TikTok. Um, but to actually single out a single company, ban them from any commercial sales, that seems unusual to me. And as consumers, um, we never really get to see the evidence, the justification no. for the ban, do we? No, I, you know, I have a, a a belief that there is an evidentiary process, that there is a requirement that they don't take these steps lightly. But as consumers, no, we won't know what that looks like. It will be, it would be unlikely that they would share that information publicly. Um, if a government did want to hack another country's critical infrastructure, um, uh, and we've seen cases, for example, in mm -hmm. the UK with, with hospitals just in mm -hmm. the past couple of weeks, um, yeah. I mean, presumably it can do so without hiding behind like a company such as Kaspersky, right? So I think, I think here's the concern, is that there is a view that we are um, potentially seeing lines drawn between uh western like western nations sort of sort of uh europe and nato and um and uh and five eyes nations and then on the other side of the line sort of you know russia china iran and north korea and that there will be a strong cyber component to these the lines being drawn and to any potential for future um aggression or or combat right and i think the view is that what we don't want to see happen is for potential what we call backdoors being planted and that basically means that you use something that you think is innocent and that you have no reason to be suspicious of but it is providing a foothold it's sort of imagine a sleeper spy, a sleeper cell right like a sleeper spy but it's a technological one that you may not ever activate or you might activate it when you need it and i think the concern is that you could have that be really widespread in every sector of your of your economy 
and including your critical infrastructure, and that that could be catastrophic if it was then activated at some point in the future. Which sort of suggests that it's about possibly, and we don't know, of course, future risk rather than something that's already happened. I just finally, yes. I mean, what, what should um, you know? What should users do about this? I mean, I think if you are a user of Kaspersky's products, so firstly, I would say for users in this country, they should wait and see what the UK government will say and whether the UK government will will also support this or um, or will not, right? They will be doing their own research and they will be sharing information with, with the US government. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, if you do have Kaspersky and you are concerned, then there are other options available on the market. It might be worth having a look at what those are and trying to understand what a replacement would look like. And you also might want to to go through your logs or your um, your security data to see whether there is any indication of any activity that looks suspicious, right? Those, those are the kinds of things you can do as an organisation. As a consumer, I would just say, for consumers, don't worry about it too much right now. Wait and see what the UK government says. Jen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was uh, Jen Ellis, founder of uh, Next Gen Security. Now, there's growing evidence, it seems, that some of our closest relatives in the animal kingdom use plants to treat themselves when they're sick or injured. In the latest study, published in the journal PLOS One, scientists recorded chimpanzees in the forests of Uganda that appeared to be unwell, looking for plants with antibacterial or anti-inflammatory properties. <laughs> Well, that's the sound of a chimp in the Budongo forest in Uganda, where the researchers uh, worked. Uh, Dr. Elodie Fryman from Oxford University is lead researcher and joins us now. Good to have you with us here on uh, NewsHour. And you lived in that forest, I think, for eight months. Um, what did you see the chimps do? Can you give us an example? Yeah, so thank you for having me on. Um, throughout the eight months that, that I was working in the forest, um, yeah, I saw quite a few really interesting uh, behaviours that the, the chimpanzees exhibited. Um, one example, I think, which illustrates sort of what specifically we were looking for um, quite well is we saw a, a, a subadult male chimp um, named Pascal, and he, he left the group um, and started eating uh, ferns, which is a very unusual food for the chimpanzees at, at Bodongo. It had only been seen in the 30 years of observing the chimps. It had only been seen one other time. And this chimp, Pascal, interestingly, also had a very wounded hand. So he was clearly in a lot of discomfort. He was limping. Um, and so that kind of tipped us off that there might be something sort of unusual. Again, none of the other members of his group um, ate those ferns. So that's an example of kind of one of the behaviours that we would keep an eye out for that so, would raise alarm bells for So us. what did you have to do then with that fern? What, to take, a, take, a, take, take one of the ferns and then sort of test it to find out what it might have been doing? That's exactly right. So uh, over the course of those eight months, we, we collected uh, behavioural data on 13 different plant species. Um, and then we collected those plant species and we shipped them off to Germany, where our colleagues in New Brandenburg did a slew of different pharmacological tests on them to see if they had antibacter antibacterial or anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And then when we were, you know, when we had all of that data, in addition to the health data on the chimpanzees and the behavioral data of what they were eating, we were able to kind of piece together the different clues and try to triangulate a case that these different species that we had collected were, in fact, medicines for the chimps. Now, the key question is, how do the chimps know this and how do they learn it? I mean, how, do they learn it from, from their elders? Is this uh, decades of or centuries of experience? I mean, how? I love this question because it's, it's an example of something that we still don't know. Um, if I had to put money on it, I think that there is absolutely some level of social learning going on here. So there's been, there's been some evidence that some maybe more simplistic behaviors um, that are self-medicative are instinctual. But I think when you get down to cases where you're talking about specific plants in specific forests that have to be eaten in specific ways, I don't think there's any instinct that would drive chimps to be able to understand that at that level. So I think there's absolutely some sort of learning happening here. And just finally, am I right in uh, thinking that uh, people living in the same area in Uganda also use some of these plants for their own medication? Is that right? That's right. So we did uh, also interviews with um, traditional local healers. And I think no surprise, people who live near the forest edge absolutely know how to use the forest, how to uh, identify medicinal plants. They've been using it for years. And we also present in our research cases, not just from, um, you know, Uganda, but also around the world of some of these plants being used in traditional medicine as well.
Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. That was Dr. Elodie Fryman of Oxford University and lead researcher on that new study into those self-medicating uh, chimpanzees. You're listening to News Air from the BBC World Service. Do stay with us. We've got lots more coming up in the second half of the programme. Coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to hear the director, John Landis, paying tribute uh, to the actor Donald Sutherland, who's died. We're also going to be hearing from President Macron's hometown about public sentiment there as the first week of campaign campaigning in the French elections draws to a close. Do stay with us. Distribution of the BBC World Service News Hour in the U.S. is made possible by American Public Media, producer and distributor of award-winning public radio content. APM, American Public Media, with support from Progressive Insurance, providing direct car insurance rates side-by-side -side with other insurance carriers. Customers can see rates and find an option that works for their needs. Now that's Progressive. Learn more at Progressive.com. On the next Brian Lehrer Show, two history segments with resonance for today. For Pride Month, we'll check out a new exhibit from LaGuardia Community College about the struggle, even in supposedly progressive New York, for the landmark gay rights law passed in 1986. Plus, the author of a new book about the 1999 anti-globalization protest in Seattle, what may have seemed fringy then, is now very mainstream. The Brian Lehrer Show, weekdays at 10 a.m. on WNYC. WNYC supporters include Earth Justice, a national legal nonprofit fighting for a healthy environment for all. More at earthjustice.org. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. WNYC, independent journalism in the public interest. 93.9 FM and AM820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. It's the BBC News Hour on WNYC, 82 and mostly sunny at 9.31. New York City has released a new plan for how to repair a decrepit section of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. WNYC Stephen Nesson reports. Stack the traffic. One layer heading east, another layer below it heading west. That's what the city wants to do with the crumbling triple cantilever that's bedeviled the city for decades. Former Mayor Bill de Blasio riled residents by suggesting the city build a temporary roadway at level with the Brooklyn Heights promenade so crews could rebuild the BQE beneath it. That idea went nowhere. In 2022, the Adams administration wanted to cover the roadway with slopes that connected the cantilever's third-level promenade to neighboring Brooklyn Bridge Park. That idea is also unpopular with locals. The new approach to fix the 1.5-mile-long stretch could still cost as much as $5 billion. If it moves forward, construction could begin by 2029. A cab driver is fighting for his life this morning after police say someone shot him in his car last night near Prospect Park. Police say the driver is 52 years old. He suffered a gunshot blast to his face while in a black Mercedes about a block away from the Brooklyn Museum and Grand Army Plaza. Detectives are investigating in a motive and are still looking for the shooter. A Manhattan judge has dismissed and sealed criminal cases against 30 Columbia students and staff arrested during pro-Palestinian protests on campus this past spring. More than a dozen protesters who are not students or staff declined offers that would have dismissed their cases later on as long as they followed certain conditions. Attorneys for that group asked that their cases be dismissed outright as the students were. University officials declined to comment. Still delays on NJ Transit in and out of New York Penn Station. We'll keep an eye on that for you. 80 in sunshine right now. Going to be a hot one again today. 92 feeling hotter. You're listening to News Hour. Not every actor gets a presidential mention when he or she dies, but Donald Sutherland did. Joe Biden said Sutherland, who died at the age of 88, was a one-of-a-kind actor who inspired and entertained the world for decades. The director, John Landis, the man behind the Blues Brothers, an American werewolf in London and many others, has been talking to the BBC's Justin Webb. I adored him. I met him when I was 18. I was a gopher which are now called production assistants, <laughs> on uh, Kelly's Heroes, which was this enormous MGM production in the former Yugoslavia, behind the Iron Curtain in 1969. We were there for nine months, 
making this silly movie about a heist stealing Nazi gold. And it had a huge budget and a huge cast. It was Clint Eastwood, Telly Savalas, and Don Rickles, and Carol O'Connor, and Donald Sutherland. They were very funny, and I would talk to them. And so I, that's, I met Donald then. What was he like when, when you met him and when you talked he to was him? What was very he like? goofy. He was very, very goofy and funny and didn't take anything seriously. And he was very much like the character he was playing in M.A.S.H. Why was he such a great actor? What was he able to do that, that, that other actors struggled to? I think Donald was wonderful on screen because he could be in the moment. And if you look at his career, which is incredible, uh, just in terms of the directors he worked with, he worked with Robert Altman, he worked with Fellini, Alan Pakula, Nicholas Rogue, and he was in huge movies and tiny movies and so many comedies. He made a wonderfully funny movie with Gene Wilder that I think he's the, I think it's Start the Revolution Without Me. Wonderfully funny. And Gene Wilder and Donald are both spectacular in it. He played all these parts, this range of parts. He is also very famous, isn't he, for being in a sense an unlikely sex symbol because he played in Don't Look Now a role that just had not been, I suppose, played before, this idea of sex being portrayed on the screen that uh, amazed people at the time and, is a, in a sense, has stayed with us. It's a wonderful film. And you're talking about the explicitness of the sex scene, which was unusual at that time. But I think the nudity is what people talked about. I don't think Donald came away from that as a sex symbol, but he was. People found him very sexy. He played all kinds of parts. He was wonderful. An amazing actor, really, much better than he was given credit for. If you look at the width of his characters, it's remarkable. And it's quite sad, and I will miss him. The director, John Landis, talking there to my colleague, Justin Webb. This is the BBC World Service in London. You're listening to NewsHour. I'm James Menendez. Let's head to France now, where the first week of campaigning in the country's snap general election is drawing to a close. The first round of voting is on Sunday week. The decisive second round is a week after that. President Macron called the election after he was trounced by the far-right national rally in the European elections. He's hoping the vote will give him a majority in Parliament. But the omens aren't good. The BBC's Hugh Schofield has been to the president's hometown, the cathedral city of Amiens, about 130 kilometres north of Paris, to sample local opinion, which is definitely swinging away from its once favoured sun and behind the far right. OK, here we are. Now, today we've decided for once not to do the classic thing, which is to go to a picturesque, lovely market in the middle of town, but to come here on the outside of town, an ugly shopping commercial centre, hundreds of people around, because this is actually where most ordinary people do their shopping. All I know is that today the national rally is a party just like any other. It's a party that says it is for the French and which tries to do the maximum for the French. And we need it because, uh, frankly, right now we're at rock bottom. France is a mess. Immigration, cost of living, nothing works. And it keeps going further downhill. Things can't get any worse than the way they are. So now is the moment to do something I have never done before and vote for the National Rally. Yes, sure, in the past the old National Front was scary. They were racist or whatever. But things have totally changed. They're not like that at all now. If you ask me, the far left is more racist and more fascist than the national rally. The local MEP for Amiens was, until two weeks ago, Patricia Chagnon of the national rally. Now she's running for parliament in the elections which are coming up. One of those rare characters at the RN who actually speaks fluent English, she's not at all surprised 
by the big swing to her party here. They should not be bullied by the EU who is trying to impose uh, regulations on them. They should not be bullied by the extreme left who wants to totally open the French borders to everyone. They shouldn't be bullied by extreme liberalism. Our country has come to a grinding halt. And we represent the party who wants to put, who is going to put France back on its rails. If the move towards the national rally is borne out, then France is heading into completely unknown territory with President Macron somehow having to cooperate with a prime minister from the far right. For the political scientist, Bruno Cortrez, it's a recipe for instability. If Macron first lose the election, second, that the consequence is that we have a hard parliament, many people are going to ask Macron, you should resign. Macron clearly said, I won't resign, but we could be in a situation where in the beginning, so the middle of July, it would be the Macron mandate, which is clearly uh, on the front uh, of the discussion. Increasingly, here in France, it feels like the Macron era is coming to a close. It's thinking about what's going to come after that's making people very nervous. That was the BBC's Hugh Schofield reporting. The drug Azempic was developed to treat type 2 diabetes, but it also helps some people lose weight because it suppresses appetite. And that's driven demand to astronomical levels. Its Danish manufacturer is now worth half a trillion dollars, the most valuable company in the European Union. But demand has led to shortages, and shortages have led to counterfeiters pushing fake Azempic onto the market. Well, Dr Bahija Raimi Abraham is senior lecturer in pharmaceutics at King's College London and an expert in fake or substandard medicines. I asked her, first of all, what kind of counterfeit versions of the drug are out there? So when we're talking about fake Ozempic, there's two things that we're really taking into account. So one, you have fake Ozempic, the product, the drug. Then you also have the fake Ozempic pens. So the pen itself that's used to administer the drug Ozempic is falsified. And the drug in Ozempic is is semaglutide, isn't it? Yes. Um, Are some of the fake products out there, I mean, do they actually contain that or, or some of them don't contain anything at all? So if something is substandard, that means if, let's say, the approved, regulatory approved Azempic contains 100 milligram of something, then the substandard will include 50 milligrams. So it's less than what's expected. Then if something is falsified, it means that the packaging might say it should be Azempic, it should be this, that, the other. But actually, when you analyze the product, there's nothing in there. So it could be there's no drug present at all. It's false advertising of what's meant to be in the medicine, or it could also be there's something else inside instead of the actual drug. So when we're talking about fake Azempic, we're talking about the falsification or their substandard drug in the Azempic pen. And so thinking about the the alert from the WHO, the World Health Organization, what are the potential dangers to people uh, who encounter fake Azempic? let's say somebody is using it for diabetes, there's the risk that if they're using a product that's a fake Ozempic that doesn't have the active ingredient in there, it could lead to effects as it relates to their diabetes control. This is really a big issue. There could also be contamination. So it could be that the falsified product has not been made under sterile conditions. So this could lead to all sorts of different issues, infections. There are lots of negative effects of using a fake Ozempic. Is it getting into national supply chains? Is there evidence that it's finding its way into those uh, official supply lines, if, if you like, and therefore ends up being prescribed by doctors? There's been evidence that the fake Ozempic was identified, I believe it was Brazil and the UK and America. And when they were identified, they found that the UK batch, some of the product had actually been entered through legitimate suppliers, so legitimate wholesalers in Austria and Germany. And so, yes, there's a massive risk that because these products have been falsified so well, they are entering the legal supply chain. So if we just go back to the WHO product alert, how they were able to identify and confirm that these products were falsified was looking at the batch numbers. So two of the batch numbers weren't recognised, but then unfortunately one of them, the batch number was 
genuine. But then when they did analytical testing, they identified that the product was falsified. So unfortunately, these products are being able to get into the supply chain, but there are systems and checks in place to try and make sure that these products are identified and flagged as falsified and removed from the legal supply chain. Because from the consumer's point of view, presumably the advice is to don't buy it off the internet, make sure that it is prescribed by the doctor. But of course, you know, with with the caveat that, uh, as you've been explaining, you know, some of this fake stuff might be getting in that way as well. 100%. And, you know, this is where we talk about obtaining your medicines from a reputable source. But also there are things that as an individual, we can be empowered to do to check to identify if the product is real or not. So some general tips really is to look at the packaging, right? So spelling errors, how does the medication look? And I would say as it relates to Azempic, the manufacturers, they've actually put quite a lot of information and communication out for people to be able to compare between the real and fake Azempic pens, as well as even the needles. Dr. Bahija Raimi Abraham of uh, King's College London. We were talking on the programme yesterday about extreme heat around the world. Well, another of the countries simmering in unusually hot weather is Greece. It is coming into full summer there, and uh, summer in this part of the eastern Mediterranean is always very warm. But the mercury's already hit 40 Celsius in parts of the country. That's more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the sort of figures you'd normally only see on a few days in August. At least five people have died in the past couple of weeks because of the heat, all of them tourists out on hikes. Well, nearly 40 million people are expected to visit Greece this year. Let's talk to Kostas Lagovardos, who's uh, Weather Research Director at the National Observatory of Athens. Uh, Kostas, thank you very much for being with us today. How unusual thank you, thank is you, this? James. How unusual is this heat wave uh, in Greece at the moment? It is unusual because in, in June, in total, uh, up to now, is very warm. It seems it will be the warmest uh, uh, June we have on records. Not only because you have three, four days of heat wave last week, but because uh, all the days of the month are very, very warm. We have even today 40 degrees in the western part of the country. One week ago, we have 40 degrees in Crete in the eastern part of the country. It is, I think, the first time we experience such a persistence of heat for such a long period. Not always heat wave um, temperature because this is over 37, but there's a persistence of very high temperature uh, with respect to the normal virus. Which, uh, this, at this period, it's, it's, uh, the, the maximum temperature would be around 30, 31 degrees. Right, so quite a big increase. Why is it so much hotter than normal for this time of the year? Is there a meteorological reason? It's, uh, it's always a reason. It's a, a persistence of high pressure system over the eastern Mediterranean and uh, the advection of warmer masses, warm uh, masses from Africa towards the eastern part of the Mediterranean, and they persist. And they have this uh, uh, deviation from the normal, which lasts since the beginning of this month. And according to our forecast, this will last also up to the end of this month. We have a June, which is more like July or, or August now. And this is understand something that is... Um, it's a surprise for us, although we know that uh, due to climate change, we expect to have such situations, but they come faster than we imagined. Yes, indeed. And we're also tired, told that these sorts of events, because of climate change, will become more frequent, more common. Um, do, I mean, in the case, I mean, not just people in Greece, but also visitors to Greece, do, do people need to take it more seriously in the, in the health risks associated? Of course. And the problem with the tourists is that maybe they don't have the correct information from the news because it's in Greek about uh, the, an upcoming heat wave. We are trying as meteorologists to, to give this information. I think we, we do, we're doing a good job in warning people, but the, all these warnings cannot arrive to everybody at the end. And uh, tourists that are coming uh, and uh, they expect to have normal temperatures, as I said, around 30, 30, 32 degrees as a maximum temperature. And finally, they are under a heat wave of 40 degrees. And when they make some physical exercise, like walking a path in an island, it's very easy to have a heat stroke, especially at this period of the year, because we're in the beginning of summer and the human uh, body is not yet acclimatized to high temperatures. Always the first heat wave is more, more dangerous than heat waves that can occur later in summer. Can I just ask you this briefly? And I know, I know you're, you don't work for the, for, you're not a government you know, uh, official or a politician, but I mean, are there risks to Greece's tourism industry if people start to think this is 
this is the sort of normal temperature that they can expect in summer. Yes, this is a problem not only for Greece, but for the whole Mediterranean. We saw that last year with the big forest fires, with the heat waves again, we had heat wave last July that affected the whole Mediterranean. But I think that uh, the, we know that Mediterranean is a hot spot for climate change, and uh, we see now um, temperatures and um, other phenomena, for example, storms in early, early autumn, that did not occur in the past. So uh, I think this is a problem for the whole Mediterranean area, and we have to find uh, ways to mitigate these problems okay. and also to warn people when they visit these countries that they can they can face high temperatures yeah. and other problems. Yeah. Say, to Cost, high Costas, like we'll have to leave it there. Costas Lagovardos of the National Observatory in Africa. Distribution of the BBC World Service News Hour in the United States is made possible by American Public Media, producer and distributor of award winning public radio content, engaging audiences, creating meaningful experiences, and fostering conversations. APM, American Public Media. With support from the Wall Street Journal, from the boardroom table to what's on the kitchen table, it's your business. This is New York City's own station, WNYC. WNYC had its first broadcast 100 years ago. On July 8th, we begin a year-long celebration of WNYC's legacy. In honor of WNYC's 100th birthday, how about making a $100 contribution today? Call 888-376-WNYC or go to wnyc.org slash donate. So, the voice of New York City, WNYC, bids you all good night. Support for WNYC comes from the Wilmont Theater, presenting Celtic Woman, White Christmas Symphony Tour, December 15th at the Wilmont Theater in Montclair. Tickets on sale now at Ticketmaster.com or at the Wilmont Theater box office. With the enhanced WNYC app, you can do it all. Listen to WNYC Radio Live, catch up on podcasts, and read stories from Gothamist and NPR. Download the WNYC app now at WNYC.org slash app. Up next on The Brian Lehrer Show, legal analysis from a constitutional law scholar on the latest Supreme Court opinions and a preview of the big ones still expected this month. Plus, a history of the fight for New York City's landmark gay rights bill. Those conversations and more at 10 this morning on WNYC. 84 and partly sunny now today, mostly sunny and hot. 92 feeling hotter with a chance of afternoon showers and thunderstorms almost the same tomorrow and hotter on Sunday. This is News Hour with James Menendez. When it comes to refugees, Sudan is a crisis like no other. The numbers are staggering and hard to fathom. The civil war has forced one and a half million people to flee the country. Another six million are displaced within Sudan. Well, the current focus is the city of El Fasha in the western region of Darfur. Hundreds of thousands of people fled there to escape the advances of the feared Rapid Support Forces, a paramilitary group that's tried to wrestle control of Sudan from the army. But those people are now trapped. El Fasha is essentially besieged by the RSF and aid agencies are warning darkly of an impending catastrophe there. Filippo Grandi, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, has just come back from Sudan. My colleague Nula McGovern asked him what he'd seen. More displacement, a huge number of people streaming into the relatively stable areas of the country from those areas that are engulfed in the civil war, Khartoum, the Darfur states, the Kordofan states. And of course, uh, this huge displacement is a big burden on the country. The schools have been closed for more than a year, so there's no education given to Sudanese children. Hunger is rising in many parts of the country because of the difficulties in providing food and of course, what we hear from refugees coming out of the war areas is uh, a, um, the most abysmal reports of human rights violations, like uh, rape of women, forced recruitment of children, armed people coming into houses and uh, for extortion or theft of goods, of money. The reality on the ground is that the war is fragmenting into a myriad armed groups controlling each one a portion of the territories and affiliated 
more or less loosely to the two big groups, the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces. The war is becoming much more complex and much more dangerous as well. I did see this week that Sudan accused the United Arab Emirates of arming the rapid support forces, the RSF that you've mentioned there that have been fighting Sudan's army. It was the UAE ambassador then responded, calling Sudan's charge ludicrous. Do you have any comment on that? 